Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 50. Have you wanted to get your Python code to consume data from web based APIs? Maybe you've dabbled with the request package, but you don't know what steps to take next. This week on the show, David Amos is back and he's brought another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We discussed an article titled Python APIs, a winning combo for reading public data. And David shares another real Python article about creating microservices using Google Remote Procedure Calls, or GRPC. We also cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including making a difficult data analysis question easy with pandas, efficiently clean text with pandas, the tricky bits of Python concurrency, building rich terminal dashboards, making better assertions for Python tests, and building and managing real-life data science projects with Metaflow. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, David. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me back. We got a, a couple of really great real Python topics that we want to start off right out the bat. And what's very cool is they're related yeah. <laughs> in many ways and very excited to talk about them today. And then we're actually going to dive pretty deep into uh, data science. So what's your first one? First one I've got today comes from uh, Dan Hipschman. It's an article called Python Microservices with GRPC. And this is a pretty extensive article. So it, it falls into that category of almost a bookical, <laughs> as they've been, <laughs> they've been called in the in the past. That's the terminology? Yeah. I think it was uh, Mike Kennedy that that started calling them that with uh, you know these like super long, okay, like very thorough art- articles that that we've got. But this one is all about an introduction to like what microservices are and what that design style entails, and then also how you would create a microservice using the gRPC style of uh, of creating like a like an API. So this is different from like a rest a restful API. gRPC is Google Remote Procedure Call and it's a very different kind of take on what uh, an API is. So yeah, it walks you through just, you know, why you would maybe want to consider the microservice design style, what micro actually means because like you think of like micro. So it's like super small, right? Like it's a, it's like well, Yes and no. It's it's. Uh, he says, you know, micro is a little bit of a misnomer. Like, really, these should just be services. But the idea is that you know they're they're isolated from each other rather than like a monolith type application where everything is all all together. So separate code bases, usually managed by separate teams, and the other services in your in your application don't need to know like really what's going on behind the scenes or anything. They just need to call the service and get some data. Uh, and everything, but they don't necessarily have to be micro nece- necessarily. And talks about you know what the trade offs are between the two different like this monolith versus microservice idea. And he gives you some example of of microservices that you use through the article. He's got like a book marketplace, like a minimal web app that's going to display a list of books to a user, and a recommendation service that would provide books in which the user might be interested. So these are kind of the two examples that you're using throughout the article gets into defining the structure of these microservices using something called protocol buffers, which is a language that allows you to sort of define what the API is, similar to something like the open API spec, like where you can define like in YAML or JSON, kind of the structure of your API and what kinds of parameters different uh, endpoints take and, and things like that. So, and then gets into, you know, what really is this remote procedure call, how it differs from a RESTful RESTful API. And kind of the main difference is rather than using these like HTTP verbs, like the git and post and delete and 
all these different uh, verbs that they have. This is more focused on like your calling of function. It's a remote procedure call. So there's a function that does something and you, and it's remote from you and you, you call that function to do, to do something. So it's, it's a little bit different idea there. But yeah, it just uh, walks you through this, this large example of, sorry, the example is not very large, but, but it goes through how to set all this up and how to create clients. So one of the advantages of using these protocol buffers is that you can automatically generate clients and automatically generate the server. So you sort of define your API in this single file and then using a Python library, you can just automatically generate a client library and automatically generate a server library as well, which is something you can also get in like a RESTful API. We've actually got a series of of articles by Doug Farrell talking about using this uh, connection framework with uh, with Flask. Yeah. And it's a similar idea where you're sort of um, automatically generating some things and then uh, there's there's libraries out there to generate client libraries automatically as well based on this uh, open API specification. Once you've got the client and the server going, he talks about you know getting it production ready, talks about things like Docker and networking in Docker, using Docker Compose, how to test these things, and then finally how to uh, deploy it to like a Kubernetes cluster, and then also monitoring your microservices with things called interceptors. And then a, a discussion on some best practices around all of this. So it's a pretty thorough discussion on this whole topic and a really neat look into this gRPC and, and how to use it in Python. So pretty good stuff. Yeah, these deep dives are fantastic for anybody wanting just to get into these concepts and see multiple sides of <laughs> what they're going to have to work with. I love that he's including the best practices and yeah. all these other kinds of things like monitoring and and um, all that kind of other things behind it. So there's like from the history of concept of microservices all the way to care and grooming of them, which is really cool. Yeah, it is neat because th- definitely uh, there's a lot of tutorials out there and this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you know, you, you build some sort of uh, API or something and then it maybe shows you how to like deploy it, right? Right. Maybe a, a cloud service or something. And then it's like, and then you're done. And it's like, well, you're never <laughs> done, right? Like now you have to like, is it still working? Like, is it working properly in production? Like, you know, how do I, how do I even tell that this thing is like doing what it's supposed to do? Or how do I monitor for like, you know, failed requests and like all that kind of stuff? So it is neat to see all that being discussed as well in one, in one article. Yeah. My first one is from Pedro Preguero. And it's called Python and APIs, a winning combo for reading public data. When I initially looked at it, I was like, oh, okay, it's an, another one kind of talking about APIs. And then I'm like, oh, wait, this is actually you know consuming them, which is actually a really popular concept right. you know, yeah. for beginners who want to get into playing around in Python. It's like, okay, well, you know, what, what kinds of things could I build and what kind of things can I use here? And... I had created a course. Um, it was one of the very first courses I ever made for Real Python about an, an article about the request package, and so that was something I wanted to learn very early on. I was like, "This seems like something I'm going to use and kind of dive into." And what's interesting is, is I feel like a lot of people get confused very early on as to the concept of like what requests is trying to do. They think it's primarily just to consume any kind of web data. Really, request the the idea behind it is that you're going to point it at a very specific API, and whereas some people might be confused and they're thinking, "Oh, I actually want to uh, scrape a website, or I want to pull data from a website in in the raw out of the raw HTML, or you know whatever different techniques that you have out there." And we've we've covered that before with you know, talks about beautiful soup and. Mm-hmm. We've covered a, a few other kinds of tools that can help with like dynamically generated websites. But what can be a much more efficient way is to actually go directly to an API yeah. and be able to go to that endpoint and then you know query and pull very specific information. So this article starts in kind of a nice historical way, like we were just talking about SOAP and REST, and then also the newer one to the bunch, which is GraphQL. And I have to admit, I was not that familiar with GraphQL. I've had a few people come on and talk briefly about it, but I didn't dive very deep into it myself. And I was a little confused as to what it provided, but it's a a newer query language 
for working with APIs that's developed by Facebook. And I think it's something, if, if you're interested in this and want to kind of see the future of where we can go, it might be another offshoot, kind of like you were just talking about the idea of remote uh, procedure calls, the idea of like calling functions. This is similar in the sense that you can kind of request multiple things and and the idea that some of the information might be unpacked by the client and not having to like grab so much data all the time, like pull like all of it and then have to sort of sort through it. You might be able to specify more specific things. And I, again, I'm still on the the cutting edge of like just trying to learn what what it's about, but I'm I'm kind of intrigued by it, what what it can do. But I think this is a great follow-up for somebody who was like, oh, okay, I kind of understand what requests can do. This article really goes deep into doing it. And <laughs> there's lots of examples, lots of really kind of fun APIs that Pedro gives you to play with and kind of bounce against. Um, there's this really kind of fun one that's it's sort of like a dog API. <laughs> and so you're asking you questions about breeds and and you know, kind of pulling back different information and you're learning about query strings and and then you know, it kind of really covers like those really important API related concepts about like, all right, h- how do I you know structure it? You know, what's a response code? Looking at the different uh, information that comes back, and then like I said, w- I really like that it has lots of these public APIs for you to kind of play with to kind of learn about what's happening and the different styles of APIs um, that are out there and the different formats that they can kind of come in. And then it goes into more advanced stuff. It talks about authentication, which is you know, kind of the next layer and level of, of things that you might run into. And then beyond that, if it's really deep and a lot of information, it talks about pagination. So like there's like lots of pages of information that are coming back to help you with that. But then also something we talked about when talking about scraping, how you might be a good consumer of data and how you may want to work with rate limiting and, and figuring out like, you know, how when you're consuming this information, you know, what sort of rates are allowed and what's, what's happening. And, and then what's fun is at the very end of it, there's uh, several practical examples. One is searching and fetching for GIFs or GIFs, <laughs> again, how you want to pronounce it. <laughs> there's one a more serious topic of getting COVID-19 confirmed cases per country. And then related to what you're talking about before, there's one uh, uh, searching through Google Books and their extensive API there. We started off with talking about, you know, building some APIs and building endpoints of places you can kind of pull data from. And we've had lots of those on RealPython. But this is, again, a a nice beginner slash intermediate introduction into really consuming APIs. And and in this case, you're working very directly with a request package and uh, diving pretty deep. So if you're, we're wondering, like, what's my next step if I've learned sort of the basics of requests? I think this would be a great article for you to kind of build up off of. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, too. Just, you know, learning how to consume these APIs is a really, really good skill to have, whether you're a, a, a data scientist or or just someone who is working for a company that would benefit from being able to integrate public data into either decision-making or just, you know, analyzing the, the data that the business is, is producing. Yep. Or even if you're a scientist and just want access to, to data as, you know, for, a, for research that you're doing. I know that uh, even in journalists nowadays are, are starting to use uh, APIs and things like that. So it, it's something that I just feel like that skill is, is beneficial to a really wide range of people that are <laughs> yeah. using Python. So it's uh it's definitely something to i think to put on your list of things to learn if you if you're uh, if you haven't already yeah and there's so many different ones that are are public you know so it's nice to find yes ones yeah. that you could kind of play with and experiment with and you know there's obviously ones that are paid for like certain weather data or other you know things that were, it might become costly for you to experiment with so it's nice to have ones that yes, you can yeah. kind of play with and practice your techniques of like, okay, how do I comb through this? How do I format the data that comes through? And different ways of sort of packaging it into something that, you know, be nice to display and add to your, you know, different applications. But yeah. again, we were talking about projects that you could put in your portfolio. I think this is really, you know, something a lot of employers would look at and say, all right, this person understands like how to talk to other services. And if anything, in the connected world we're in, 
sharing and serving data is like so <laughs> popular. So you should uh, at least have some familiarity with with how that how all those handshakes happen. So yeah. Well, and speaking of data, I mean, once you get it, one of those things you might want to do with it is analyze it, right? Yeah. <laughs> nice transition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the next article I've I've got is. Uh, comes to us from someone named Martin, and unfortunately, I was un- unable to find their last name on the the web page here. It just says Martin, but it's drawing from data is the blog. The title of the article is "Making a Difficult Data Analysis Question Easy," and the the difficulty of the data analysis question that he shows in the article, I would say, is a little bit up for debate. Like whether you would actually say that's truly difficult or or not. But what I really liked about the article was that it highlights kind of a problem-solving technique that is very powerful and can be very useful when analyzing data. So to kind of set the scene, he it's taking a look at a data set that's looking at temperatures, minimum and maximum temperatures for different cities around the world based on each each year. So like there'll be a row uh, for like the year 1995, and then you've got a column of like, uh, it starts with the city Abidjan. I'm, I'm familiar with that city. Abidjan underscore max. And it's got like the maximum, maximum temperature for that, for the year 1995. And then another column, Abidjan underscore min. And it's got the minimum temperature for, for that year. It does not say what the units of temperature are here, which is interesting, but kind of irrelevant to the, the analysis that he's going to do. So you've got a whole bunch of these columns, like city, underscore max city name underscore min and then the rows are are different years and the question is or what you're trying to get is the temperature range for each city right so it's not that hard i mean you just subtract the maximum i'm sorry subtract the minimum from the maximum for each year and it kind of gives you the what the range was so the range is like a single value like it like the it it was a 26 degree range right that uh that year so i guess you're looking for like cities with where the the temperature doesn't fluctuate a whole lot in other cities where the temperature fluctuates a lot, uh, like it does in my city, which we've had an insane range of temperatures. (laughs) Yeah, same here. (laughs) We got into the single digits. Yeah, and we were deep in the negatives recently. So yeah, (laughs) Yeah, which is unique. I had lived in Hawaii and you could look at the, the temperature and it would be like, you know, it didn't matter. It would just be the same. <laughs> right, yeah. And continue on and on. And right right now, that sounds kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for so. sure. I'm in I'm in Houston, Texas, and, and we got down, I think, to like eight or nine degrees last week at the, the low point of this cold front we had. And then literally this week when we were back up in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, that's not Very wide range, yeah. But anyway, so you've got this, this, uh, this data set, and you want to you wanna compute this, this range for all these different cities. But what makes it kind of challenging is that is the format of the data. So you kind of have to like go through and it's like, okay, for each city, well, the city is like encoded in the column names and each city has these two different columns for it. And you end up having to do a lot of kind of manual work to to, to sort of get the, the data that you need in a format that, that you want to like be able to present it in. And so that's the challenge. It's not that the that the analysis is necessarily hard. It's that the format of the data makes it kind of difficult to work with. And so he goes through two different solutions of this. One where you just stick with the original format of the data set and kind of use a little bit of elbow grease and some manual work to kind of get what you need out of it, which is fine. That, you know, one of the things you learn when you ever have to do any sort of data wrangling for a company that has a long history of data is that sometimes you just have to do some manual work. <laughs> That's just the, the <laughs> yeah. nature of it. But once he goes through that solution, he then talks about uh, a second option, which is, hey, you could reshape the data to then make it really easy to answer this, this question and get it in a good, in a nice format. So he talks about a, a strategy doing that where you reshape the original data frame this is all using pandas and pandas data frame. So you reshape the data frame using the melt function on the data frame and a little bit of uh, additional work there to get it into basically, instead of having a data frame with two columns for each city, and I don't, I don't know how many cities there are in this, like, you know, I don't know, 50 or 70 cities or something like that. You have a, so you've got a ton of columns, right? You've got a, a, over 100 columns. Yeah. You instead 
turn that into a data frame with four columns where you have a column for the year, a column for the city, and a column for the, the maximum ten- temperature and a column for the minimum temperature. And then your solution basically is just you have to sub- like subtract these two columns from each other, the minimum column from the maximum column, and now you've got everything you need in each row. So, so that's what I thought was really neat about this article was just showing how when you're confronted with data that has a complex format, you, you know, and think about the problem that you're trying to solve, reshaping the data might be a good first step to get it into a form that makes it very easy to then uh, solve the problem that you're, you're trying to solve. I thought that was really good. Yeah. So like grouping things or Mm -hmm. uh, pivoting or all these kind of different techniques like melt is definitely an interesting one too, to help (laughs) <laughs> you know, kind of make things a, a much easier format to 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 navigate and uh, apply. Absolutely. You know, whatever you're wanting to do mathematically or, you know, data analysis on it. So that's funny because my, my article is so similar to that in, in a lot of ways. So we're kind of following these great themes this week. Yeah. What's, what's yours? Mine's from Practical Business Python, which we've mentioned a couple times on here. Yeah. Again, a really great site for people working with Python day to day. And very often not in a huge data warehouse sense, but a, like a smaller set of things where you're working with like Excel files or CSVs or these other kinds of things where it's not necessarily a, a hosted warehouse and so forth. The title of this one is called Efficiently Cleaning Text with Pandas, which is a bit of a misnomer. It's not so much cleaning text, but sort of, I would call it more wrangling text and, and kind of managing and grouping things based on the text because it's not really reformatting or per se cleaning in the same way. And, and those can have different definitions. But it's by Chris Moffat. The data set in this case is uh, liquor data <laughs> from the state of Iowa. And it's an open data set that they've allowed you to download. Um, unfortunately, I was having a little difficulty finding the exact data set that he used. I think he probably cleaned up some of it to kind of narrow it. The data set that I ended up downloading ended up being four gigs of, <laughs> of oh, CSV wow. it was a huge CSV at that point. And a lot of the tools that I might use just to open it and look at it were kind of struggling a little, with it a little bit. You know, you might have to navigate a little bit to try to get down to like something a little more manageable, like half a gigabyte or something. But again, a big, long list of these sales to a variety of stores. And the trick with it is he wanted to organize the data to be able to see not by individual locations of stores, but by sort of groupings of stores. And they were, you know, names of stores, like it could be Costco or Sam's Club or Walmarts, or there's a a set of stores in Iowa called Hy-Vee, which you can already think, okay, well, that might be spelled multiple ways, or they might be all caps, or they might, somebody might might put a dash in Walmart or not put a dash in there. And so using regular expressions and using some techniques that are built into pandas. He was using these really kind of nice tricks of using uh, the str.contains and looking at, okay, you can have it ignore case, which is nice, and you can have it either you know pay attention to regex if you want. And um, so he went through four different sort of, what he calls them cleaning attempts, to try to figure out what would be an efficient way to do this. And in that case, he had to kind of create a way of like, okay, look for this potential way of spelling the name of the the store. And the store names, unfortunately, would include additional location data in the name. You know, so the data was kind of messy. It wasn't just like, okay, this is a high V by itself. It'd be the high V that's in Jonestown or something like that, or or it could be in Iowa City or something. Or it might have a a number, you know, store number in it or have Mm -hmm. some of the kinds of weird data. And so it was, you know, kind of finding this keyword contained within it and then kind of looking at ways to kind of clean it. So it goes through them. I don't want to go too deep into like you know, every single cleaning attempt, but it, it, it's a nice way of looking at different ways to group this data. In this case, a, a really good practice when you're cleaning data is not to destroy the data, <laughs> is to actually <laughs> go ahead and try to make a new row um, or a new column in this case to be sort of this grouping column. Yeah. And so it's based upon the other columns that are there and, and as opposed to transforming what's in it. And so he's covering multiple ways and then kind of actually gets a little bit into optimizing the whole process of like, how long does it take to do this this method versus that method? And again, with four gigs of data, 
um, in my case, you know, being optimal might be important in looking at, you know, well, how long is this going to take? And then he ran into this uh, a solution f- based on a code example from Matt Harrison, who developed like this sort of generalized function. And then he had actually some readers who actually helped him optimize it even more uh, at the end and kind of going off of a set of pattern lists and kind of working in it. But what I found throughout the whole thing you know, there's a lot of neat techniques here, and I I think they're all useful to kind of look at and and think about, and they're very specific to to pandas in this case of ways that you could work through working with the data. But what I thought was great is he linked to this other article, which I found vastly more in depth in, in the topic of cleaning. It's by Randy Ao, who has a blog called it's a Substack blog, Counting Stuff <laughs> is the name of it, <laughs> and. The title of the article is Data Cleaning is, all caps, Analysis, Not Grunt Work. And then uh, the subtitle is also, Most Data Cleaning Articles Suck. (laughs) (laughs) The TLDR on it is, Cleaning Data is Considered by Some to be Menial Work. That's somehow beneath the sexy real data science work, and he calls BS on that. And I really have to agree. Mm. Like, I spent more time cleaning data and transforming data and getting it into the right format than I did really the, you know, data science. And, you know, we've had uh, Kyle on a few times and we've talked a little bit about this. Yeah. Um, the idea of, of the whole role of, you know, someone being a data engineer. I don't know how else you're going to learn your data <laughs> if you're not yeah. swimming around inside of it. You're always going to need to see some of that raw information. Yes, you can, you know, see the first 10 rows or see a set of random rows. But until you've actually like really dug in and, and seen all the unique versions of of the way something has been spelled, he gives a really great example based on the PPP loan data that the government was doing over last year. Yeah. And it's based on like how many are the how many different ways could people spell the city Philadelphia? <laughs> <laughs> it turns out there were at least 57 different ways. <laughs> <laughs> it's not surprising. That's hilarious. <laughs> and it included the abbreviations. And uh, there was from a tweet from Stephen Rich. It was really kind of funny. You know, obviously there's like, oh, you could call it Philly or you could Philla or some other kind of things. But just the random like misspellings were crazy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I've used a tool before to help with things like that. This sort of fuzzy wuzzy. It was like a fuzzy matching mm-hmm. thing that you could help with, you know, again, text data was what very often what I was dealing with in, in, in the marketing world. Yep. And you know, every data set's going to be different. You're really going to need to learn and, and learn how to deal with this kind of, of things. And then what he's focusing on also is the idea that as you're doing that and building these transformations and building these techniques, you're actually building tools. Yep. You know, you're building things that you're going to reuse. I mean, if you're doing it smartly, and you're help hopefully you know fix things and make your analysis algorithm you know not have problems or choke. You're reducing unwanted variations, and then in a lot of ways you can be eliminating bias where you don't realize that somebody cleaned this in a way that you didn't know that it was already biased or the the techniques that were used to gather the data was biased. And I, I know yes. that it's been a common thing where people have talked about machine learning systems like computer vision systems that really don't know what to do with dark skin colors, which is a horrible thing, you know, like as far as like, okay, you've trained it on these, you know, photo sets that were available publicly and they did not have a wide variety of people in them and and so forth. And so, yes, it's a really neat article. And I really thought that it kind of took this idea of cleaning and thought about like the concepts behind it and that I feel like, it's something that's not celebrated very often, the idea of it. And then one other kind of focus that he had and that I thought was great was the idea of fully documenting every cleaning decision that you made. Oh, like, well, why yeah. did you do it this way? And, and, and so forth. And kind of, you know, the way that we talk about documenting code, the same could apply or should apply in this way. So somebody could come back and look at, okay, well, I decided to narrow this. To go back to the original article, one of the things that he eventually started to do is to look at, those store names and and to sort of flip it into categorical data, which is something you can do in pandas, which really reduces the size of of strings <laughs> and text files inside of that. And I think it's something that gets missed very often, the idea of like 
even if there's only, I don't know, 200 different stores or whatever, the idea of changing that into to a, a category is going to be such a smaller footprint of data than to, it to be all those separate strings having to be saved and, and kind of uh, looked at. So exactly the idea of flipping your, your, your data into categories, um, and we've talked about, you know, saving things as different forms of integers because very often, especially from a CSV, they just all come in as objects and that generic object size is huge. Right. So especially with something like a four gig data set, um, yeah, you may yeah. you may want to look at that pretty early. And that was something that he used that ended up optimizing his processes a lot. So really some nice, you know, food for thought for the, you know, people looking for techniques for data cleaning, but also just the a little bit of a cheering on people in the in the trenches that are actually busy doing some of this hard work. Yeah, that's that's really good points that that are made there and I completely agree that th- there is this this misconception I guess about what like data analysis and, and data science is and that it's it's the quote unquote sexy bits, right? Like the the machine learning and everything. Right. But one of the things that that I found when when I was doing these kinds of things for a company was I was I was working for a company that I I knew nothing about the industry right really and so I was not a domain expert by any stretch of the imagination and who were the domain experts they were the people in sales they were the the CEO they were the, like the people that were like living and breathing this in that industry and you know the data you hear people say things like, you know, data can tell a story and everything. And like, right, the, right. you know, we talk about like analysis is like bringing that story out and everything. Well, getting in and like digging through the data and having to like do the, the cleaning and the, and the wrangling or just trying to understand like what decisions were made, why things were stored certain ways, like why, like that's all a part of that story. And it's going to help inform the decisions you make later and how you present things and and how like how you clean things and and it's all an important part of it and so yeah it, i absolutely agree that like it is like data cleaning is data analysis like it's not some additional thing that you can like like just delegate to an intern that doesn't know anything like right <laughs> interns can help with it right but like it's it needs to be presented as like an integral part of the the data analysis pipeline. And then the other comment I just want to make that you, that you kind of mentioned a little bit in that second article you brought up with with this issue of bias. I get the sense from a lot of people working in data science, maybe not working in data science but that are new to data science is that like models have bias but data doesn't. And that is absolutely incorrect like yes models can be biased but right. data absolutely can be biased and like you said like how was that data collected what methods were, were used to collect that data and those are things that you're going to discover when you start cleaning things because you're going to like uh, and start wrangling with it right like you're going to have a better understanding of of how that was done and be able to identify that that kind of bias that was one thing like like I had a boss that used to always say things like, well, numbers don't lie. And it's like, well, yeah, actually they can. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so anyways, I just, yeah, there's literally a book. I think that's about, uh, how to lie with, you know, statistics and you know, there's like ver- right. a whole, like a uh, subset of those things, you know? Yeah. So, so anyways, I just wanted to comment on that. Cause I think those are really good points and really important. And, and there is this sort of like, mentality of like uh data cleaning you know like like no like it should be like it's not necessarily the most exciting thing but i got some really amazing insights into the company that i was working for right because i was cleaning a whole bunch of data that that they had produced and i would never would have gotten those insights had i not been uh, had i not been doing that so i don't know uh my thoughts on that <laughs> <laughs> that's cool This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another RealPython video course. This one I mentioned earlier in the episode. It's titled Making HTTP Requests with Python. It's based on a RealPython article by Alex Ronquillo. And in the course, I take you through making requests using the most common HTTP methods, customizing your request headers and data, using the query string and message body, inspecting data from your requests and responses, 
making authenticated requests, and configuring your requests to help prevent your application from backing up or slowing down. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how the request package can help you work with APIs for consuming all that public data we mentioned earlier. And like all the other video courses on RealPython, the course is broken into easily consumable sections. And now all the courses have transcripts and closed captions. Check out the video course and you can find a link in the show notes or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. But now we can, I guess, shift gears. But I guess it could, it, we could relate it to this idea of, uh, you know, dealing with large data sets. And the next article I've got is called Python Concurrency, the Tricky Bits by Hamil Hussain. And this is a really good kind of introduction, I think, to concurrency that, that looks at, at it from a really interesting perspective. It's based off of a talk given by David Beasley that uh, I'm not sure if Hamill attended the talk or or what, but oh, it says it was recommended to him by a friend of his. So maybe he just watched the YouTube video or not. But but it kind of walks through like um, uh, really like working from the ground up as to like what the problems are and like why what is concurrency actually solving? And it, I really like the the kind of the little story that it tells. So it starts with a CPU bound task. Compute the, the nth Fibonacci number. This is kind of a, a classic example I've seen whenever you, you get into like recursion yeah. or or the topic of like generators in, in Python, you see this Fibonacci function come up a lot where, you know, it, it starts with, you know, if n is less than or equal to two, it returns a value one. And then from there on, it just calls itself it adds, you look at the sum of the previous two uh, numbers in the series, and that gives you the, the next Fibonacci number. So it starts with this. Well, this is a very expensive function <laughs> when you get into very high values of n, uh, which is the, the parameter for this function. Pretty quickly, too, takes right? a very Yeah, pretty quickly. It takes a very, very long time to compute. It starts with this, and then it starts with, it says, okay, we've got this Fibonacci function. Now let's build a simple web server. And what's cool is it takes it actually builds a web server from scratch using the socket package in uh, in Python. So you create a little web server that like it, it accepts a connection on uh, you give it like an address. It accepts a connection from that uh, address, and it sits there and it waits for the client to input a number, and then it it calculates the Fibonacci number and returns this. So now you've got these two two things going on, right? So you've got a, a server that is taking allowing connections to it, and then also a, a very expensive CPU-bound task that the server is trying to, to run. And this initial attempt at it is you build a server that can only accept one connection. So that's like the first issue you run into, right? It's like, oh, it can only handle one connection. Well, how can we start, you know, how can we handle multiple connections? Okay, well, we can, it gets into different techniques for doing that, things like threading and processing, you know, but you you quickly then realize it's so quick. Well, now you can accept a bunch of connections, but it's still super slow because this Fibonacci function is super expensive. So I, it's it's not a real in depth article because, like I said, it's it's sort of a summary of this live talk that, that David Beasley gave, but it really does a good job, I think, of of like just starting from the very beginning and just like seeing like all the little wrinkles that come up and like uh where the these little bottlenecks that you run into and i it i like that approach because it it really seems to just highlight very quickly and very clearly what problem concurrency is solving and why there are sort of these multiple approaches to concurrency because you think you know you have threading you have multiple uh, multiprocessing you have asynchronous programming there's all these different approaches to doing concurrent concurrency and it's not just in Python, in any in any language. And so this really kind of gives you a, a unique background from what I've seen in in, a, in an article on concurrency to where it, like it really just clearly, it makes it very clear why you need con concurrency and, and why you need these different approaches to it. So I thought that was really, really cool. It does get into some like very basic examples of like, you know, how threads work, how multiple processes work, 
but it's very basic and just links to a lot of um, other articles and like books where you can get more information, YouTube videos, things like that. It gives an example of asynchronous programming and some uh, like a little note here for data scientists that kind of specific to them on like processes versus threads. And he mentions that he says found many data scientists and uh, including himself that blindly ap apply processes and completely ignore threads. And so there's a little sort of uh, sidebar here where he just sort of talks about like, it's actually used, like threading can be useful in data science as well and uh, and some thoughts on, on that. So just a really fascinating article. And again, what I just really loved about it was I, I just thought it really, it was, it was the clearest introduction I felt like I'd, I'd seen to why you need concurrent programming and why there are so many different kinds of it. So I thought it was really good stuff. Nice. Yeah, that sounds like a really useful tool to build on top of, you know, all the different things we were talking about, async and await and yeah, these other tools that have been added to Python. But very often there isn't the why <laughs> that, right, you know, yeah. is, it could be included there. And, you know, there's definitely in a lot of these industries, especially data science, where it's like, well, there's actually a big why, <laughs> you know, that yeah. could be answered. So that's cool. Well, and what I loved about it, so I, I love good examples. Good examples are extremely difficult to come up with. And the example here is, has to be credited to David, David Beasley, but this is a, to me, is just a beautiful example of a very minimal server that accepts a connection that, and also has a very expensive CPU bound function that it's, that it's calling. So everything is wrapped up in this one, like really simple and very easy to understand example, which is just absolutely beautiful. So yeah, that was enjoyable from, uh, from that perspective as well. Nice. Mine builds on top of <laughs> a few other things that we've been talking about. It's using a, a library that I was not familiar with called Rich. Um, there's actually quite a few of these mm, yeah. uh, libraries that are out there that can kind of help make the terminal a, a lot nicer looking and and um, can and add some additional functionality. The title of it is Building Rich Terminal Dashboards. So the idea of like, a lot of people think of dashboards are like the dashboards we were talking about before of, you know, hosting on a website and showing lots of data. Yeah. But sometimes you may want something that's just, you know, locally on your own machine, pop up in a terminal and show some ongoing information and keep going. And so some people have taken, the creator of Rich is Will McGugan. And he uh, got a tweet from some people who took his library and modified it and said, hey, check out what you could do with this and had created this multi-window version of it. And they had hacked the library to kind of do that. So he said, well, they don't need to do that anymore. I've added it to the library. And he had <laughs> updated the, the library to do this stuff. And he they had created this thing called GHTOP that showed a real-time stream of events from the GitHub platform. And it looked really good. And he was like, oh my gosh, I see this potential and how this could be a really hand, handy thing to keep running. And again, being that, it's a command line interface and very much just text base. Um, and I hadn't heard this term. I guess it's common, but I hadn't heard of it. A TUI, a text user interface. Yep. <laughs> and so this allows you to really kind of take advantage and really build a, a more elaborate TUI. And so in this really short article, it's showing you how to build a five-section layout with like a header, a footer, two sort of stacked boxes on the left-hand side that are sort of half height, half width, and then a right side full height, like main box. And, you know, with like, gosh, it's like, I don't know, 20 lines of code. It's really short. And then if you want it to be able to actively resize, he created a, a sort of a loop that can kind of pay attention to that. So I built it up and created it in, in VS Code. And now it would resize no matter what size I made the terminal window which is really slick. It's a minimal amount of code to uh, build on top of that. So if you already have a command line interface sort of program, or if you have one that actually will stream data into it, building on top of some of the examples we talked about before, this would be a really neat way to kind of, you know, connect to an API and show data live and have it updating. Um, this might give you a nice interface that isn't necessarily web-based. You could, you know, build it right inside of a, a command line interface or a terminal. So uh, I was... Impressed with it and mm -hmm. the color uh, fonts and those kinds of things that it adds to it are actually pretty slick too. I was uh, impressed with. Rich seems like a really nice library to 
to check out if you're interested in uh, delving into creating uh, maybe terminal dashboards. So, yeah, or just for lots of things in the terminal. Rich is just uh, it's it's a toolkit of tons of amazing things. It's got really cool progress bars and uh, just all sorts of stuff that you can use in a like a terminal you know, command line application. So yeah, Rich is a really cool cool library. Nice. So that dives us into that's sort of a bit of a project <laughs> in a yeah. way, but I kind of building on top of it. But we'll we'll give a couple more here. So what's your project this week? Mine is a project called Python Precisely, and it's it looks like it's a pretty old. Old meaning like it, it looks like uh, it may have come out uh, or been started like like five years ago. Maybe there wasn't much work on it back then. I don't know the whole history of it, but it's had commits as recently as eight days ago, looking at, at the time that we're re- recording this. So it's still, you know, in active development. It's called precisely, the, the subheading for it here is better assertions for Python tests. And it's basically a a bunch of helper functions for doing assert statements in Python and asserting that, you know, two things are equal or, or something is contained in something else or just anything you'd want to assert, which is something you do a lot in, in tests. But it's got a, a really cool API. I, I really like the API and how it reads. Yeah, it just looks looks really nice. So it's got this assert underscore that function. So assert that. And then the function takes a couple of parameters, like a result, right? So you've you've done something and and you want, you know, you've gotten a result in some variable and you want to check that you want to assert that the result, I don't know, is equal to something or has uh, a certain attribute set to something or the, the attribute has is of a certain type or or something like that. So so this this assert that function, you pass it like that result and then and then some other uh, results of some other fun- uh, helper function in the library. So it's got things like has adders, things like contains exactly, things like is sequence, or things like includes. I don't know, there's all these different helper functions. So like, here's an example. Let's say you have a result and the result is you've done something and you've got a list that contains the strings A and B. A, like string A, comma, string B. That's your result in a list. But the result, all you care about the result is that it's a sequence. So it could be a could be a, a tuple, could be a could be a, a list. You don't care about the actual type. You just want to know that it's a sequence type, right? So you would write assert that result is sequence, and then that is sequence function you pass string A, comma, string B. So this will this will check that it's a sequence type. And and contains only the elements string A and string B in that in that order. So it just like it just reads like a sentence. It's it's really beautiful. I, I really like this little uh, API that he's got. So there's tons and tons of helper functions in here that that you can use to to write these really nice looking assert uh, assert statements. So really fun little little project. Definitely worth checking out if you're into into testing and and seeing if that's something that you might be interested in using. Yeah, I think that would save you a ton of time if you were <laughs> if you look through these and you say, "Oh my gosh, I I thought about ways of trying to do that, but doing it yourself, I, I think it would be quite a bit of work to roll your own." So this sounds like it's going to solve a lot of those testing problems for you right out of the box. It's nice. Yeah. Mine is going toward the data science end of things and it's from Netflix. It, it's the project called Metaflow. And it's been around for a few years. Um it looks like it its most recent update is version 2.27, which came out in February. Um, so it's you know constantly being updated. But this is a tool that the infrastructure team at Netflix created to help the data scientists not have to focus so much on infrastructure. <laughs> and so it kind of talks about the ways that if you want to build a new data science project, how this can kind of help you structure it and it will help with the allocation of resources and those kinds of things. And it's a, uh, it's big. I did not have a ton of time to dive really far into it, but I, I could see how any time that you're moving beyond your own personal laptop or a personal machine, how, you know, 
the infrastructure stuff and you get into Kubernetes, you get into Docker containers, you get into all these kinds of, you know, more advanced things of having literally a data lake and stuff like that and how this can help sort of abstract a lot of that. And then it also has a really interesting methodology of stepping through procedures, which I think is really interesting, kind of going back to something you were talking a little bit about there of the idea of concurrency and and also in projects of being able to look at the data as you're going. So like you complete step A, but that can be sort of saved and analyzed as you're kind of going through the process and potentially reusing that data. Um, it's a neat project and is an excellent tutorial um, in my opinion, I thought it was really well done and I was able to get through several steps of it. And of course, it plays initially with uh, Netflix movie data, which is kind of fun. So in, it, you can run in a lot of it inside of just a, a Python, you know, like a VS Code or some other kind of thing. But it also runs in R. So they've kind of built it for you know multiple sides of the data science world. And then as you're working with it, if you want to have something that's a little more playful, you can actually open it up inside of a, a Jupyter Notebook um, though you do need to run some of the examples initially in, in say, Python initially to kind of build the structures that it's analyzing and working on top of. But I think it's a great project for anybody who wants, wants to get a little deeper into data science and would like to ha- to see, okay, well, what what does the infrastructure look like as we start to scale stuff up? And it can kind of give you an idea of uh, some of the stuff that's in there. And there's some good uh, links to in the documentation to talks where they're explaining the technology and um, how it's being implemented. And you know, anytime you can kind of see it. And it's funny because they <laughs> there's definitely a, a lot of back and forth between these large companies like Spotify and Netflix and Facebook and, and, and so forth where they make this technology open source. And very often, you know, when you just see it and you look at it, it's hard to really get a, a scope of it. So it's nice to kind of go back and, and look at these presentations by the engineers and like what their thinking was, like why they are building this tool. Uh, again, going back to the why. Yeah. And I think that's something that's missing very often when, you know, something just gets posted up on GitHub and you're like, I don't, I don't know where <laughs> the where <laughs> or the how, maybe some of the, you know, the what is there, but uh, you know, very often missing is, is the why and like, what were they trying to solve? And, and they definitely focus a lot of that on, in the documentation. So, so check it out if you uh, are interested in diving a little deeper into larger data science projects and um, want to play with a little bit of uh, Netflix data there. Uh, it was a nice round of uh, articles and projects you, you brought in this week again from the Pi Coders. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks to everyone for, for writing great content. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's <laughs> always fun to share all that stuff. So yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming in again. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Talk to you soon. See ya. I want to thank David Amos for coming on the show again. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.